everyone at Centerpoint, welcome. I'm so glad that you are here. I'm so glad that all of you are joining us wherever you are, home, outside. I know it's a little cold, somewhere else in the world. We are glad, though, that you are here uh, as we are in part two now of this series, Regift. You know, in every December, I mean, this is going to be pretty obvious, but every December we tell the story of the birth of Jesus. And now the Christmas story you find in the Gospels of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. They really give you the, the detail that we know of when we think of the Christmas story. The Gospel of Mark just kind of jumps right into it. Like Mark's not jo joking around. He's kind of like more the action gospel, right? A little bit more like the movie Die Hard, right? The greatest Christmas movie of all time. Can I know? So here's the thing. There's a lot of debate if Die Hard is or is not a Christmas movie. Now, of course, I've only seen the made for TV version as a man of God, but, but is Die Hard a Christmas movie or not? And I I know that we have to just end this theological debate at center point once and for all. So here's what I want you to do. Just real quick, you can do it in the comments. Just let us know yay or nay for Die Hard being a Christmas movie. Because I, I need to settle this, but I think it is, right? And so you have Matthew, you have Mark, you have Luke, and then you have the Gospel of John. Now the Gospel of John, on the other hand, does something very different. John goes all the way back in time to the beginning of heaven and earth. But there's another part in the Gospel of John that's actually a retelling of the Christmas story. And many of you may even have this version of the Christmas story memorized. It's in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. See, the Christmas story is all about what God has given to us. It starts with Jesus, but it's so much more than even just Jesus. When we really look about the Christmas story and all that God has given us, I want to unpack some of the, the realities of how much God has given us here today. And part of that is an idea of God's gift to us of generosity, and so today, I, I want to talk specifically about re-gifting generosity. But to understand generosity, um, we're going to go to a different text in the Bible. We're going to go to 1 Timothy. So I'd encourage you to open your Bibles to 1 Timothy with me and head to chapter 6. Paul is right now finishing this letter. It's a letter he wrote to his spiritual son, Timothy. And he spent these last six chapters, in essence, teaching Timothy how to be a pastor. It's one of the pastoral epistles, one of the pastoral letters. And here we find that Paul's coming to the end of this letter. And these are the last thoughts that he wants to leave Timothy on how to pastor people. He says this, chapter 6, starting in verse 17. Paul says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. I find it interesting that Paul's final words to Timothy are actually on generosity. That this topic is so important to him that he wants to leave Timothy thinking about this very idea. And I believe Paul is doing it because he knows the implications in the world when the church has a generous heart. And the, um, the detriment to Christians when we don't. And so let's unpack this. There's a lot here that I want to make sure we get through each and every part of uh, 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. And so this is how Paul started off. He said, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Verse 17 itself is so packed with things that we need to learn and understand here. And he starts with the word command. I don't want you to miss that because this is emphatic. 
Like, like Paul's saying, command, like you are a general with your army. You're saying, go, this is what you must do. This is not a suggestion. He's not saying, oh, simply imply this to the church. Paul tells Timothy, command this with the apostolic authority that I am now putting on to you. Command it to the people. And then he says, who are you to do this for? The rich. <laughs> Some of you are so excited right now, right? You're like, yes, I am poor. I don't have to worry about this section of scripture. I'm in debt. I'm in the red. I just spent every last penny I had on Christmas gifts. So let's move on to next week's topic, Brian. What do you got for me then? Well, I, I don't want you to get too excited yet that you're poor, all right? Because the thing is, I need you to remember that wealth is relative. It really is. Wealth is relative. For example, do you know that the, the medium annual household income around the world is just shy of $10,000 a year? Household income, $10,000 a year. I want you to think about us in our scenario. Right now, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to our Massapequa campus here. You're seeing this from Massapequa here in New York, where the annual household income is $125,000. Now, last year uh, with World Vision, our church sponsored 600 and I think it's three or four, 604 children. Last year from Uganda, it was a, a little village called Kimwenge. And there in Kimwenge, I was there, I had a chance to be there and see their life and see the poverty in which they lived. And in Uganda, the average medium household income is only $1,775. Less than 2000 in Uganda. In Massapequa, 125000 I know you can be rich poor, but, but you, you see the discrepancy. And listen, I'm a realist. I know that living in Uganda is far cheaper than living in Massapequa. I mean, our taxes alone is off the charts. I, I, I get all that, but, but I want you to hear this. I, I think you get my point. We're actually richer than we think that we are. We, we actually have more wealth than we may assume that we do because we're comparing it to some house on the, the far south shore and north shore of Long Island that's two, three million dollars. You're like, oh, I'm poor. Well, hold on there. You, you may have a lot of debt. You may not own a lot of your house yet, but, but when we look at the big picture, we're actually, as a nation, wealthy. And this is also, for me, a heart check for all of us, no matter who you are, no matter what your financial position, th this word on generosity is still for you. Because you know what? You can actually be financially struggling, but still be so pursuing of wealth that it has deterred you from what God has called you to do. I was called you to think and act and be. You could have still made an idol of wealth even if you haven't had it. So these words are important for all of us to hear, whether we consider ourselves rich or not. And then this is Paul's command, <clears throat> not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Here is the fundamental problem that I struggle with, as I know you probably too, with wealth in general. It is so easy to trust money over God. I mean, can't we just all admit that? Uh, I mean, if I have $50 in my hand, I know it's in my hand. I know what it can do for me in that exact moment. But with God, we have to often step out in faith. Like, it's easier to trust money than to trust God at times. I, I, I think we need to be real with ourselves. Like, no, there, there is an internal struggle that I have in regards to this. And as Paul said, wealth is temporary, <laughs> It's actually uncertain. It's not as firm of a foundation as you may think that it is. I mean, for one, you can't take it with you. We all know that. Your, your wealth isn't going with you. When you die, it's gone. But not only that, it's so easy to lose. Do you guys remember at the beginning of COVID when the stock market crashed? I have a retirement account. Um, it's nothing to brag about, but it's there. And it was funny because when the stock market crashed and it got to the lowest point that it did earlier in COVID, I, I did something you should never do when the stock market crashes. 
look at your portfolio, which I have like one thing in my portfolio, but I, I looked at my retirement, it was gone. Like it was wiped out. I was like, if I had to retire today, I could go to McDonald's and order something off the value menu and have a lunch. It doesn't take much. <laughs> it doesn't take much for the economy to collapse, for business to change, for circumstances to shift, for insurance not to work, to be sued out of no, like it doesn't take much to lose wealth. And so Paul is asking, like w- when you think about it, What are you really depending on in your life? Where are you really putting your trust? He's not saying money is wrong, but he's asking, are you putting your trust in money or are you putting your trust ultimately in God? The challenge is there. And then Paul does, as he often is so good at it, as he writes these letters, he gives us a spiritual redirect. He shows the problem, but now he's going to show a solution. And Paul goes on, he says this, he says, that we need to put our, their hope, Christians need to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. He's changing our focus. I love this thought. He's saying, listen, you need to put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything. And you might be asking yourself, well, what did God really give us? <laughs> you know, what, what has God done for us? What has he actually given us? Well, we already read John 3, 16, so we know salvation's on the table. And even though I believe that's the most important gift he possibly could ever give us, it's actually not the only gift God has given us. I love how it says in James chapter 1, verse 17, that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. Every good and perfect gift. Friends, here's my point. Every good gift in life is a gift from God. Amen? Like every good gift in life is a gift from God. I mean, Paul even says like God's going to provide everything for your enjoyment. Like he wants you to have this section of our life that we're able to enjoy, this part of our life that we enjoy. Yes, I know it's it's going to rain on the just and unjust of life. Yes, I know there's going to be hard seasons, but, but God, when he made creation, when he made our lives, when he made men and women, when he made intimacy, when he made food, uh, when he made relationships, when he made worship, like he gave us this for our enjoyment. That's a part of life he wants us to enjoy. Sin has wrecked so much of it, but we certainly still have enjoyment in this life. Every good gift from God is for us. And I think it's such an important realization because one of the biggest blind spots as Christians is that we often don't recognize that all we have then is ultimately from God. Everything we have is from God. We think we earned it or we worked for it so it's ours and it it comes from us. Right? My hard work, my, my overtime, the, the, the energy I put into it, getting that degree, doing all these things. And I'm not saying that we don't do our part, but, but as we just read here from Paul or we read from James, every good gift really is from God's. We're, we're just working his land. We're working his life that he has given us. It's all from him. And this ultimately, if we see the, the, the good things in life, the, the gifts in life as is, is ours, as is our property, as is, is what we've earned, what we deserve, then it ultimately leads to an ingratitude in our heart. It creates the arrogance that Paul mentioned. It's being stingy. It becomes our idol. And ultimately, here's the problem. And here's what Paul was getting at. It leads you away from God. It doesn't lead you to grow in God or relationship with God. It leads you in the exact opposite way. Friends, hear me, everything you have is God's and it's his gift to you. So anything we do for the glory of God really does encompass the title of this series, Regifting, because it's his in the first place. You're giving his good gifts to others. So here is Paul's answer to the problem. Verse 18, Paul then says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. <laughs> He's telling us to re-gift what God has already given us. 
And to do so, he gives two specific commands. The first one is do good to be rich in good deeds. I find that generosity at the heart of what it is to be a generous person, it still starts with action. There's an action to it. It starts with being willing to sacrifice for others. Now, Paul is speaking specifically to the rich people in the church. And I find this interesting because um, what I I see in here that I think is so important for us to understand is, is wealth often makes people arrogant. I'm not saying, listen, if you're out there, you're rich, you're super wealthy. I'm not saying that you are arrogant. You could be the most humble person around. But I think we all know if you have beauty, you can become arrogant. If you have social status, you can become arrogant. If you have wealth, you can become arrogant because you're going to put your trust in things of this world. That's just one of the pitfalls of sin, of things that are, are, are in excess versus what others may have or may not have. And so Paul mentions how wealth made people arrogant. Well, Good deeds is a posture of humility. It's the opposite of the arrogance he's warning about. Remember, 2,000 years ago in Roman culture, uh, there wasn't the middle class like we understand and are blessed with here in America. You have some that are rich, and then you have different versions of poor. It's kind of what it came down to. I mean, there was certainly some middle class, but it wasn't the, the normative, you know? So you had the rich, and then you had the poor, And he is telling the rich people that, hey, listen, if God has blessed you, you need to serve. And what I find so ironic about that, I could only imagine being wealthy reading this because if you're rich, you know what you have a lot of? You have a lot of servants. (laughs) Their, Their whole outlook on life was, how do I pay other people to do what I don't want to do? And now Paul is saying, no, 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 I need you to take the posture of a servant. I need you to serve. I I need you to be humble and say, how how can I help people? How can I be generous with my time and my resources and my wisdom and my abilities? How can I serve others? Because generosity needs to start from this place of humility. And we need to see being able to serve as a position of honor. I believe that the most important thing in ministry is to always have the same perspective. I stress all the time with our staff that we are servant leaders, uh, that we're not here for the church to serve us, but we are here to disciple our church and serve along with them. That there should be no job that we're like, oh, you do it because you're, you know, you're a member of the church, but I'm not going to do it because I'm a pastor. I'm, I'm here, you're there. No, the very opposite is true. If we're going to stay as the people God has called us to be focused on him, then then there must be this strong level of humility within the people of God. Amen? We're we're not saying, no, I'm I'm in charge. It's like, no, man, how how can we do this together for the kingdom of God? It's the same concept. Do good to be rich in good deeds because that produces the heart of generosity. Then he gives the second part of it. The first is good deeds. The second, though, he says, and you need to be generous and willing to share. (laughs) You know, when we re-gift what God has given us, it forces us to put our faith in God. When we give away part of the very thing that sustains our livelihood, like wealth, like money, like our finances. And I want to share with you three areas in Scripture that I think we need to understand the place of being financially generous if we are the people of God. Remember, this is the command that Paul had told Timothy. The first area that I think that we need to wrestle with a little bit is that that we are called to be generous to the poor. As Christians, we are called to be generous to the poor. I want you to see the heart of God for the poor. If you look at the Old Testament, the Levitical law, the law that that God set up to govern his people in this theocracy he had created for the Israelites, all throughout it, he made moment after moment to make sure that no one ended up not having what they needed to live and survive. Uh, There were seasons to forgive debt. There was ways to to do the crops where you would still have food uh, that is still left provided on the threshing floor for people to eat. And in Deuteronomy chapter 15, just to show the intentionality of God in helping those in need, he says, if anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, 
Notice again, the Lord your God is giving you. It's a re-gifting mindset. I just saw that right there. Boom, light bulb, right? Do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. You may think, oh, it's a loan. Put some interest on it, make some money. But you have to remember that here also in the Levitical law, there were times to forgive debt. Now, this is money that you may not even get back. See, there is a biblical mandate to be generous to the poor. We see it in the Old and New Testament alike. This is one of these consistent realities of the heart of God of how those that are better off, those that that have been financially okay, are, are meant to be part of the bigger community and how we serve. I want to bring us real back to, to uh, Kemwenge, Uganda. Because last year, in 2019, we had this wonderful push to adopt this village and these children. As I said earlier, uh, there were 604 kids that we as a church collectively sponsored. Well, that means through 12 months of 2020, by the end of December here, our church single-handedly gave just shy of $300,000 to these kids. We gave them food. We gave them clean water. We gave them education. We gave life to kids that never could have had what we were able to give them. We gave to the poor. And this is just one instance of the many ways that people in our church serve and give and have a heart of generosity. Friends, when it comes to those in need, you, you, you can't look and say, you deserved it. You, you, you put yourself here. You're not worthy. I don't know what you're going to do with it. And there's a time and place for wisdom and making sure you're, you're choosing maybe the right organizations to, to help and serve with. But I, I want you to hear me. If you are a Christian, there must be a heart of generosity for those that are in financial need. The widow, the orphan, the poor. Like this, this is part of the gospel that we are called to live out. Amen? This is part of it. We're to be generous to the poor. The second thing I want you to see is that we're to be generous to those in our local community and our church family. I believe that when you you start to develop a generosity, it actually starts to excite you. Like you... You start to realize that this is such a blessing to bless others. You start to realize that this is a reflection of the heart of God. It starts to become almost contagious where where you may have to start saying, I may need to slow down a little bit because I don't know where I'm getting my lunch from now today. But you start to look for opportunities. Opportunities to be generous inside and outside the church. I, I could go on for months talking about over the last 18 years, the stories of generosity I've heard that have not been attached organizationally like us as a church, not saying go do this, but just people in our church finding moments to, to serve and be generous and, and generous and be kind and, and be loving with people. But I want you to know this, when we are generous with those who are not in the church, man, it shows them the generosity of Jesus. It's one of the greatest ways to to, to show the world that we are different when you just start being generous to people for no other reason but to say for the glory of God. But we're also called to be generous within the church to our brothers and sisters in Christ who may be in need. Because when you give generosity to that person who receives it, it is a tangible reminder to them of the generosity of God too. I'll give you a quick story. It's a personal one. It's a little embarrassing one, to be honest with you. But um, 13 years ago, and my, my wife just reminded me of this this week. <clears throat> 13 years ago, uh, financially, we were in a really bad place, Sarah and I. Uh, I think we only had the one kid at the time. <laughs> the one kid, Brady. I had, <laughs> we had Brady at the time. And... Uh, <laughs> And, you know, at that that stage of the church, um, financially, um, you know, know, salary was, um, it was low. Sarah wasn't working because we had our our first son, Brady, and she was about to go back to school. And um, realistically, our 
our bills outweighed our income. Here's, if you're younger out there, here's just a little bit of financial advice. You never want to get to the point, here's some, some budget wisdom, that your expenses are more than your income. That's, that was free, all right? I'm, I'm a genius here. You're welcome for that. But it was a really, really bad year. Being that it was at this point December, it's towards the end of the year, which means everything's racked up. And it was, it was really one of those years where I'm like, I, I don't think we can give each other gifts to my wife and I. And there was a family in the church who did not know any of this. And one day just happened to come by the house, gave us a box of cookies and a card. I'm like, oh, thanks for the cookies. I was actually legit excited about the cookies. And they left and I opened it up and it was a check for $500. And I remember I'd, I'd never received a gift like that before. Like, you know, gotten some 20s here and there, got a 50, but five, $500, you, you know, when, when you're struggling, a gift like $500 is life changing. That's like a million dollars in that moment. And I'm like, man, I, Sarah and I may be able to give each other a gift now. And we may have a little cushion for a little bit. And I, I can pay that one insurance so they don't take my car off the road. And I remember just the joy that that gift gave me on that Christmas because that $500 in that moment was grace. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. But it was given to us nonetheless. See, generosity isn't just about what it does internally for us. But it, it also comes out in the way that it blesses people. And we should look for opportunities to show random acts of generosity. Because <clears throat> it gives them and shows the grace of God. We need to be generous to the poor. We need to be generous to those in our local community and the church family. And then lastly, uh, we need to be generous to the church, to the local body of Christ. You know, we are so intentional here at Center Point on how we talk about money. Uh, we do so deliberately because we know that's a big turnoff for a lot of people. It's a the reason they don't trust the church. So we always try to be filled with, with grace and truth as we ever talk about money. That's why we try to be so upfront every year. Um, we make sure that there's a level of an audit. Um, there's just so many things that we do to make sure that our, our finances are, are, um, are able to be seen. We give out a report every January on, on the money. We, just, we try to be so intentional with it because, because it has been abused in, in certain church circles and we don't want that to ever be a reason that someone doesn't come to center point or doesn't trust our church. So we're always delicate with money. But let's face it, we all know that God leaves the financial responsibility of the church to the people in the church. That's intentional. I believe God's done that intentionally. And the reason is because it shows the heart and the faith of the people to God and to the, the, the local congregation that they find themselves in. And it's there in the context of the church where we're doing our part to financially give that allows to sustain the ministry that hopefully you are very blessed by. The way that we're able to do ministry for other churches, the way we're able to do ministry for uh, people that are hurting and our, our compassion initiatives, the way that we're able to disciple and lead, the way that we're able to have our facilities to gather on a Sunday, and the way we're able to bless our kids' ministry and our youth ministry, and the list of things that are all our, our, our combined income together, our giving is able to do, allows for all of this to happen. It's only from the collective generosity of the people that the church is able to accomplish the mission that God has given the church. And so I want to thank all of you who've given regularly, who've said, now, I need to be generous to the church, the very way that God has called us to do so. But, you know, the reality is, is the finances of the church are real. And everyone knows that they're real. But I know without a shadow of a doubt that the church body is meant to have such excitement about the work that God is doing in the local church and so excited about the generosity that, that God has called us to that it overflows into our tithes and our offerings within the local context of our congregation. And I just want to put it out there to you, friends. I, I, I want you to find opportunities to, to find those that are in need and to give to them. And I want you to find opportunities to, to bless people. But, 
But I, I just want to challenge you too that we also need to make sure that in the process we are blessing our church, in this case, Centerpoint Church, with what God has given us. Because I think sometimes what happens in a church like ours that is larger, that has multiple locations, is I think sometimes people are like, well, everyone else is taking care of it, so I'm going to focus on other things in how I give, Right? I don't need to worry about it. You know, another campus is probably going to make up for what I'm not doing. And I think sometimes, I'm just putting it out there, I, I think sometimes that maybe too many of us are thinking that way, not realizing that as a result, the church isn't doing nearly as much as it could if each and every one of us, to some extent, extent from the smallest amount to the largest amount, say, I'm going to do my part being generous in the context of our church to make sure that it's able to continue to thrive and accomplish reaching everyone from Brooklyn to Montauk and ministering to our body and making disciples for Jesus and seeing the work continue on. There's no question it has to be a collective effort and God is expecting all of us to do our part. And so here's my challenge to you, friends. I just want to challenge you when it comes to our, our tithes and our offerings to be intentional with your generosity through a percentage or a set amount. To be generous through a percentage or a set amount. What I mean by that is to say, listen, I, I'm going to kind of base uh, what I do more on the Old Testament where everything was percentages and say, you know, like I do personally is I put aside a percentage of every dollar I get to give back to the church. If you, you don't do anything now, maybe you say, all right, I'm going to do 2% for now on or 4%. For those of you that have been Christians a long time, you understand an Old Testament principle of a tithe, which represents 10%, which represents the whole. That's what I know I strive for with what God blesses me with. For others of you, maybe it's a set amount, but it's intentional. It's saying, no, every, every paycheck, I'm going to put 50 aside or 100 aside. I'm not simply going to tip God when it's convenient, but I'm going to be intentional with my offering, with my generosity, because I know what it's doing. I see the fruit of what God is doing here at Center Point. And it always still comes back to this that when the people of the church are generous, the ministry that we're able to do continues to expand and reach more people. He puts that on us, that responsibility. And so I hope you're at least prayerful about it and take it seriously. Notice we're not going to do an offering pitch right now, right? I just want you to see that. I'm not trying to guilt you into anything, but I, I want you to be prayerful about it. And then this is how Paul concludes, verse 19. He says, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. He's talking about treasure in heaven, which I spoke about last week, so I'm going to let that stand for now. And then he closes with this. He says, so that they, being Christians, may take hold of the life that is true life. Paul says that if you are living out generosity, that you're living out true life. You're preparing for what is to come. You're living now in the way that God has made us to live. You're living out this command that Paul has given Timothy to give us. Friends, God has given us everything, and he is looking for us to re-gift the blessing that he has bestowed upon us. I hope and I pray that Centerpoint Church, that our people will be known for their generosity. That when needs arise, when there's hurts in the community, when we see people in need that we've never met before, that we realize this is an opportunity for me to be like God to me. And I get to re-gift what he has in fact given me. May we be a radically generous people because we serve a radically generous God. Amen. Let me pray. God, I thank you so much for our time together and for this message this Sunday. I pray that it will challenge, it will convict, God, and it will help us to see and know, Lord, how to live out our life more. God, even if we can give slightly, Lord, I know that we're all in different places, but, but God, maybe we just see one person in need and we're able to help them with a five spot, Lord God, or we're able to do more for someone else because of our financial situation or even here within our church, being intentional with being 
being part of this financial, financial solution here at Center Point, God, so that we can continue to move forward as the people of God. I pray that you will challenge our hearts and let us find the joy of being re-gifters, the joy of generosity. I thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.